Hello AP Statistics students, this is Ms. Koken. We're in chapter 11 now, and we're going to be talking about inference for categorical data. So we've been working on inference since chapter seven. We've talked about sampling distributions, confidence intervals, hypothesis testing, and then comparing two groups or two populations through subtraction. Now we're gonna be looking at categorical data, again, just like we did for proportions in chapters eight, nine, and 10. But this time, we're gonna be able to do a more powerful comparison because we're not gonna just compare two things at a time. The first section in chapter 11 is all about the chi-square goodness of fit test, and we'll talk about that in detail. In section two, we're going to be looking at two other chi-square tests. One is called the test of homogeneity, the other one is called the test of association or independence. So once we really get the chi-square goodness of fit test down, then we'll be fine. And just FYI, chi-square is just another probability distribution. Like we saw, binomial distributions, geometric distributions, and of course, normal distributions. Before we get too much further on in this video, I just want to have a little disclaimer. This is a long section, so this may be to the first of two videos, just in case. So you may be committed for about 25 minutes or so uh, on this section. Anyhow, let's take a look at our objectives for section 11.1. .1. By the end of this section, we want to be able to calculate the values of the expected counts, calculate conditional distributions, and then look at and calculate the contributions to the chi-square test statistic. And we'll go into detail. I know that we don't know what all of those things mean right now, but we will. The next thing that we're going to be able to do is to check the conditions for inference for chi-square. In this case, for chi-square, we're still using the random and the independent conditions, but instead of normal, we're going to be using the large sample size condition. You'll see what that means as we go through the section. Then we want to be able to actually perform the significance test, the chi-square goodness of fit test. And that is going to determine whether the sample data that we have observed is going to be consistent with the distribution of the categorical variable that was claimed or in our hypothesis. And last of all, we want to be able to look at individual components of the chi-square test statistic and perform a follow-up analysis so we know which ones had the, the biggest impact on our chi-square value. Okay, so in the previous chapter, we discussed inference procedures for comparing proportions of successes for two populations or treatments. And sometimes we want to examine the distribution of a single categorical variable in a population. A, and chi-square lets us do that. A perfect example of this is if we look at the distribution of the colors of M&Ms. We know that they're produced in a specific, specific proportion. And the question becomes then, the, what the company claims, is that really what we get in our sample? And the only way we can know that, of course, is to take a sample and then run a, run a significance test. So we can decide whether the distribution of a categorical variable differs for two or more populations or two or more treatments, and that's referring to an experiment running two treatments, by using a chi-square test for homogeneity. So goodness of fit is, does it go along with what it's supposed to be? Homogeneity is, is it the same for the multiple groups or the multiple treatments that we're checking? And in a goodness of fit test, we're going to be looking at what's called a one-way table, not a two-way table, but a one-way table because it's only one variable taking on multiple values. In the test of homogeneity and the test of association, we're going to be looking at the traditional two-way table that we've been looking at for several chapters. And, and the mechanics of the homogeneity and the test of independence is the same. The difference that we see is the not so much the mechanics but just what it, those different tests are used for. As we go through these notes, if you want to pause the video and take notes on the different slides, please please do that. Feel free to do that and also as you need to refer to your textbook. So, if we're looking at that distribution of colors of the Mars chocolate candies, the M&Ms that we're all familiar with. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be comparing what we observe in our sample with what we expect to get in a perfect world if the sample ended up having the exact distribution of colors that the company says it does in their claim. So let's, let's look at this graph. You can see what we've 
got here is basically in the in the blue or the purple the observed value and in the red the expected value you can see on some of them it's it's quite close for example for red or brown it's not too far off however when we look at one like blue or yellow we see huge differences and those are going to be the ones where we see the large difference or the large contribution to the chi-square test statistic so the one-way table that we're looking at here has the different distribution of colors this is what we saw in our sample. This is our observed value. And the total sample size is 60. The colors are counts. Okay, so we got nine blue M&Ms, eight orange M&Ms, et cetera. So these are actually counts. You cannot run a chi-square test with percentages or proportions, but we can run it with counts. Now, when we want to calculate the proportion of blues, we would do the nine blues divided by the total of 60, so we have 15%. And that's what we're actually going to run the, we're gonna do a comparison of the percentages, but we're gonna use counts to do it. And I know that that might sound a little bit weird, but let's just take a look at what our hypothesis is. The company says that 24% should be blue we got 15 percent blue so we think that they may be wrong now remember that there's always sampling variability and it could just be that our sample was a little bit off but it wasn't so far off that it's unreasonable to assume that the company's proportions are actually correct but we need to run the test for that now we know that we could run multiple z test one sample z tests one for each of the colors but that sounds kind of like a lot of work and we don't necessarily want to do that if we have an alternative and we do have an alternative because we can run instead of multiple tests one for each color using the proportions what we can do is we can run the chi-square goodness of fit test and that's going to be one test for all of them now the truth is if we ran the chi-square test and we wanted to do further investigation for a particular color then we could do, we can always go back and do that but we want to get an overall look at how off things are so that's what our chi-square is going to be very useful for. In this bluish green box we see that it has our null hypothesis and it's phrased not in a numerical math sentence like what we've seen before. This is actually phrased in words. You can do it either way. I recommend that even if you write the words you still write it in symbols because when we get to that conclude part we want to be able to really clearly feel comfortable whether we reject or we fail to reject and if we can look at what the null hypothesis is in in symbols it's going to be a little bit easier to phrase our conclude so anyhow our null hypothesis is the company's stated color distribution for the m m chocolate candies is correct and that means all the different proportions are what the company claims they are. Our alternative hypothesis is that they're incorrect. At least one of the proportions is incorrect. And here we see it phrased in symbols. So you can see H naught or the null hypothesis gives the proportion of blues is 0.24, the proportion of oranges is 0 0.20, etc. And then the alternative hypothesis says at least one of the proportions is incorrect. We always have to say what the P stands for. So where P with the subscript of color is the true or actual population proportion of M&Ms in that color. So this idea of comparing our sample observed values to the expected counts is, is going to be the really the bread and butter of our chi-square. So we're going to first calculate how many we should expect. Now if you think about we're supposed to have 24% of blue. Our sample size was 60. So in order for us to calculate in a perfect world how many blues we should have gotten, what we're going to be doing is multiplying 0.24 times our sample size of 60. And that gives us, in this case, 14.40 is how many blue M&Ms we should have gotten if the proportions were exactly what they're supposed to be based on what the Mars company advertises. And that's how we're going to calculate all of our expected values. So the one thing we need to remember is when we actually count our M&Ms in our sample, they're just counts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And when we calculate the expected values, they're not counts, they're calculated expected counts. So we're not supposed to round them to the nearest whole number. We really are supposed to carry the 
the decimal, you know, two to three decimal places. We know in AP statistics, they really like three to four decimal places, but when we get 9.60, that's good enough of green. And what we're going to then do is compare that expected number, so in our perfect world, with the proportions that the company said, based on our sample size of 60, these are the values we expect. The interpretation of that is over the long term, over the very, very long term, we would expect to get 14.4 M&Ms in blue when we have a sample size of 60. But what we actually got was nine. Okay, so that's how we're gonna be approaching the calculation of the chi-square test statistic. So remember, we're always looking for convincing evidence, and convincing evidence means a p-value that is smaller than our alpha or our significance level. Okay, so that's our evidence. And what we're going to do is look and see where we have big differences and where we have small differences, because it does matter. That those are the ones that give the biggest contribution. So our next step is to actually calculate our chi-square value. Now I just want to rem remind you, we're looking at the chi-square distribution. What that means is we're looking at a probability distribution. In the past, uh, like we've talked about before, we've, we've looked at the binomial, we've looked at the geometric, we've looked at the normal, we've looked at other ones that don't have a specific name, special name. This time we're looking at the chi-square distribution, and it has its own shape and its own characteristics. So we're going to be expanding this summation notation for chi-square, and you can see chi is a Greek letter, and it looks kind of like a fancy X, and it's squared, and that is the pronounce, it's spelled C-H-I, but it's pronounced chi. Okay, so when we calculate these, we have the observed, we have the expected, and we're going to find the difference between the observed and expected, square, divide by the expected value, and then add all of the numbers together. The sum of all of those numbers is the expanded summation notation, so that's going to be our chi-square test statistic value. As we can see from the final calculation of 10.180, the numbers that contribute to that 10.180 are 2.025, 1.333, etc. And we can see there's one that really jumps out at us, and it's the fourth one and the one that goes along with the yellow. So yellow is the one that really had the biggest contribution to the value of the chi-square test statistic because it's over half. So pause the video now so you can read the slide and take notes on it, and then turn the video back on when you are ready to resume. Just a reminder that we always assume the null hypothesis is true, and so that's how our orientation is. We're trying to find evidence against the null hypothesis, and that means that a small p-value is our evidence. Okay, so what's this chi-square distribution look like? It is a right skewed distribution. It never has any negative values, so it's to the right-hand side of the, the y-axis, if you will. And you can see from this slide that there are many, an infinite number, in fact, of chi-square distribution curves. And what they are dependent on is the degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom for the chi-square goodness of fit test is the number of possible values that you could have for your variable minus one. So in our case, our variable is color of M&M, and there are six different colors. Six minus one is five, so we're going to be looking at a curve with five degrees of freedom. And this is the curve with five degrees of freedom. You see our shaded value, for which is the shading is the p-value. It's the area under the curve. And the axis value is 10 point, uh, I think it was 180 that we came up with. And the chi-squared is actually an axis value. The p-value, remember, is the area under the curve. So they go together. And the one thing, the other thing that I want you to notice is we read the chi-square from the right-hand side, not from the left-hand side. Remember, we read the normal distribution from the left-hand side. So when we want to find the p-value, we're going to go to table C in our textbook, or at the end of the year exam, they're going to have one labeled chi-square, and we're going to look for the, five, the number of degrees of freedom, and we're going to search for our chi-square test statistic value. Our value falls between the critical value for 0.10 p-value and 0.05. So we know that our p-value is between these two. So pause the video, 
take notes on this and I'm actually running out of time. So I'll see you on the next video for the rest of section one.